Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to you all. So, look, we wanted to talk to you this morning about uh, two different areas, or two related but different areas, if we may. The first is a survey that our uh, Arbitration and Mediation Centre, the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Centre, <coughs> has done of 400 persons um, in uh, over 60 countries related to technology disputes. Okay, and the second area that we'd like to treat is our annual results for the uh, Arbitration and Mediation Centre for 2012 in relation to internet domain name disputes. And in particular there, uh, one of the interesting features on which we would like to report uh, is disputes in relation to new uh, applications for new generic top level domains. So that part of a domain name which is to the right of the dot, like dot com. So applications for new top level domains. Uh, so those are the areas. And I have uh, with me, of course, in addition to Samar, uh, Eric Wilbers, who is the real expert and who is the director of the uh, Arbitration and Mediation Centre. So perhaps first, if I may start on the, on the technology dispute survey, which is available to you. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this um, is based on 400 uh, responses, which is, I think, a very good response rate from respondents in over 60 countries. And it gives us an idea of uh, what practitioners and industry think about uh, take the state of technology disputes internationally. Uh, there is an executive summary to the report, uh, and I think the highlights that I would uh, like in particular to signal are the following. First of all, uh, less than 2% of agreements in relation to technology result in, uh, in dispute, formal dispute proceeding, proceedings. So. Uh, that's, an, uh, that's an interesting um, uh, piece of information, at least for us. And I think the other thing that I would like to particularly emphasise, uh, you can find in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth paragraph of the press release, the third from the bottom, and I think there's some very uh, interesting results here. Uh, uppermost in the minds of parties uh, to technology agreements are uh, cost and time of <coughs> uh, dispute resolution procedures. Uh, this comes through very uh, clearly. Um, and in that paragraph to which I referred, there's some interesting information. You know, uh, first of all, court litigation is the most frequently used procedure, uh, followed by uh, arbitration and mediation. So court uh, litigation was most common standalone clause, 32%, arbitration 30%, and mediation 12%. Uh, um, in terms of time, court litigation at home, you know, in your domestic jurisdiction, on average, takes three years. Abroad, on average, 3.5 years. Uh, and similarly, legal costs in court litigation at home, on average, amount to 475000 US dollars, okay, at ho a a abroad, foreign court litigation, on average, to slightly over 850,000 US dollars. And on the other hand, if you compare uh, the alternative dispute resolution procedures, mediation took on average eight years, eight, uh, sorry, eight months, which is significantly better than three years or 3.5 years. And uh, Ninety-one percent of the respondents stated. 
91% of respondents stated that typically the costs of a mediation did not exceed $100,000. So that again is significantly better than the 475,000 or the 800,000. And then arbitration, uh, and again it's in that same paragraph to which I referred, on average uh, took slightly more than one year, which is again significantly better than three or 3.5. Uh, and on average it costs 400,000, so that's not necessarily a great improvement, except it's half of what foreign litigation costs on average. So what's the significance of all this? You know, why are we talking about this? Well, um, I think the significance is, is uh, that we live in a world where technology is increasingly important and so the contractual relationships formed around technology are increasingly numerous. We now know a little bit about the behaviour in those contractual relationships, less than 2% of them result in formal dispute resolution procedures, so this is not a massive uh, uh, amount, amount at all. And then, interestingly, you see, if you are entering into a, a technology agreement, uh, in this world there's a, there's a significant chance it's going to be between parties located in different countries. You know, it'll be an international agreement. Uh, and then it becomes relevant to know, you know, what your exposure is to uh, uh, costs and time in the event that there is a dispute. And not only what your exposure is, but what your options are. And what this survey is telling us is that non-court options, namely arbitration and mediation, are delivering significantly better results. And so it's a... a uh, you know, very useful to pay attention to that, obviously. So that's what I would say uh, on this one, and we can come back to some discussion, and as I say, Eric can take you through a lot more detail, if you would like, in relation to that. But let me move on then to um, internet domain name disputes, specifically, uh, where, as you know, if I may say, the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Centre is the champion. Um, uh, in terms of dispute resolution service provision, thanks to Eric and his colleagues. Uh, so last year, 2012, we had a record number of cases, once again, of cyber squatting cases. Uh, we had 2,884. If you go to the press release on page 9, Annex 5, You'll see the evolution of cases over the years. Uh, so you see last year 2,884 cases covering 5,000 domain names because a case can concern more than one domain name. Okay. Um, we are very proud of the fact that this is a very international procedure and it, it you know, it caters for the international character of the internet. So, in this respect, you know, complaints, complainants and respondents came last year from 120 countries. Uh, and the cases were dealt with by 341 panellists from 48 countries. So we think this, that we have here a procedure that is particularly adapted to the international character of the internet. Uh, and by the way, in 13 different languages. Um, and we do these cases, by the way, in all of the top level domains, um, the international domains, if you, might, if you like, .com, uh, .net, .org, and so on, plus in 67 national domains. So .ch, dot, you know, et cetera, uh, uh, dot, um, .fr for France and so on. Uh, as to, let me make just a couple of other comments. As to um, the areas where cyber squatting is most prevalent as judged by the cases, well, this is retail, fashion and banking and finance. Um, and you'll find some information of that in the, in the uh, press release. 
And if I may refer you to Annex 9 on page 13, you will see there examples of cases. Uh, uh, samples of cases organised by different areas, OK? So if you're looking for some banking, biotech and pharmaceutical areas, you'll see Bayer, Beringer, Ingelheim, uh, Ingelheim uh, Eli Lilly, Hoffman La Roche, Genentech, Merck, uh, Pfizer, Sanofi, Aventus, and so on. So you have there a pretty good sampling of the cases in 2012. Uh, and let me then move on to our last, the last area that I wanted to touch on, uh, which concerns uh, new generic top-level domains. Okay, so this is the uh, action that is being taken by ICANN, the, I, uh, the Internet Corporation for Assigned na uh, Names and Numbers, to open up new domains, new top-level domains, to the right of the dot. Uh, and they received nearly 2,000 applications, 1,930 applications, for some 1,400 distinct new domains. Okay, so it's a real change in the landscape that is occurring. We're going from 10 or 20, 20 or so top-level domains to here's 1,400 new ones, okay? And what we do is, in this area, the WIPI Arbitration Mediation Centre, we continue the Uniform Dispute Resolution Procedure, applying to uh, second-level domains, okay? D applying to what is to the left of the dot. So, coke.com. You know, so the Coke is the second level domain, okay? So that continues. But in addition, we have a role uh, in something called the legal rights objection procedure, okay? And that is a, a procedure whereby a trademark owner can bring in an objection to the granting of a new top level domain on the grounds that it infringes their trademark rights. So if someone asks for a domain, for example, uh, dot Coca-Cola, and they were not Coca-Cola, okay? You could bring an objection, a legal rights objection, on the basis that Coca-Cola could, on the basis that it's, it's uh, allegedly infringing your trademark rights. Uh, and by the March uh, 13 deadline, we received 71 LRO, Legal Rights Objection Cases, and you have, hot off the press, this little piece of paper, which will give you the proposed string, that is the top new top-level domain on the left. So, for example, dot Del Monte. Who the objector is, the objector, uh, the, the trademark owner, who the applicant, applicant is, the applicant yeah, is the applicant the for the string. Right. Yeah, okay, who the applicant is uh, and the status. Okay, so that's, do you want this, is, where is, it's down here. So this is quite interesting information. You know, you can look down there and you'll see, are you okay? Uh, and you'll see uh, this information, as I said, hot off the press for these cases that are coming out now. Um, I think the only thing, other thing that I would mention, if I may, and then you can, you can ask questions, and particularly for Eric, um, the only other thing that I would mention is that, you know, last year we were particularly active in expanding the range of our dispute resolution procedures. And one of the things uh, that we are doing, new things that we're doing, is cooperating with national IP officers to provide uh, mediation proceedings in respect of what we call opposition proceedings before the officers. So let me just explain that. If you apply for a trademark, you know, and let's say the IP office grants it to you, uh, then there is usually a period, either before or after grant, where someone else can object to the grant, oppose the grant to you. It's 
called an opposition proceeding. They say, we, sh we don't think you should have granted that or you should grant that because it's too close to our mark. Uh, and where uh, that was a formal sort of a judicial, quasi-judicial procedure, we're applying uh, mediation here in cooperation with the Singapore office and in cooperation with the Brazilian office. And we had our first cases in Brazil, uh, in Singapore, Singapore, that went very well last year. So there, I uh, will stop my remarks there, and we're happy to talk. Questions? John. John Falcon. Um, the number of domain cases, domain name cases, has been going up progressively. Uh, is there an indication why that's, that's been happening? I would say a simple explanation would be increased use of the internet. So increased range of potential infringers. And, and that if you work on the basis that a certain percentage of human behaviour is deviant, uh, and the more the behavior there is of behaviour, the more cases there will be. Did you say 71? 71, yes. But there's not 71 in this list oh. because they have not all yet been processed. Crystal clear? How do you explain the, the difference between the home jurisdiction, the cost of home jurisdiction, and the foreign? Well, uh, if you're trying to manage a dispute, the legal uh, part of a dispute, uh, and you're doing that in your home city, obviously your transportation costs and your, you know, and possibly language interpretation costs and your assistance costs and, and so on are going to be uh, reduced compared to doing it a, a elsewhere. Can you just uh, say again the difference between the objector and the applicant who's on which side of these 71? I got a bit confused. Yes, yeah, sure. So did I. The, the <laughs> objector is the person, the trademark owner. Right. And the applicant is the person who has applied for the new domain. Okay. Who wants the new domain? So basically, Amazon has uh, uh, staked its claim to a lot of uh, a lot of these new domains, and it's, it seems to be a repeat defender. In, in, um, uh, well, there's no judgments yet, <laughs> so I wouldn't uh, uh, say it's a repeat offender. Uh, but um, yes, there are uh, there is a claim against them in the couple of areas, as you see. Um, But I think it's interesting to look through the list because you can see that this gets complex. You know, blue, for example, that's a, the blue cross, um, is uh, objecting. Pinterest is objecting uh, to dot pin. The U.S. Uh, Postal Service objecting to dot mail. Dot song, yeah, dot tunes. Dot com. That's a good one. Dot com, uh, and the objector is Verizon. Verizon, or Verizon, Verizon, yeah. Verizon. And some of the objectors are in fact applicants themselves. Yeah, so I see that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, questions. I just want to. No more of our previous 13 Annex 9, somehow we are in many cases in 2012. I'm in a list of companies 
what, what is this this community? Could you just elaborate what happened to the world this period? And the I just see one picture of two thousand twelve. I just want to know how the geographical distribution has or has not changed compared mm -hmm. to the past. Thank you. Um, so the first question, what, what is the status, what is the outcome of the listed cases? The listed cases, as the Director General mentioned, uh, really are a sample, basically to give a public impression of the types of uh, um, um, applicants, in this case complainants, and the types of domain names, trademarks that are involved in the cases. So they're a sample among you know, the, the total number of cases. Um, and um, if you would like to know the precise status of uh, of cases involving that particular uh, uh, complainant or trademark, um, we have, and, and Samar, we, we always make that available, of course, we can do that right away. We have on our website a search facility on the website of WIPO and then the section under the WIPO Arbitration Mediation Center, uh, where you can just key in the name of, as you can, for example, quote from this, this attached list, the name of the trademark owner, um, and uh, in that case, you will find everything about that case. You'll find the outcome of the case, but you'll also find the decision itself. So you can also read the, uh, the uh, considerations by the, uh, from the panelists that actually decided the case. So for each one of those, it is entirely possible to find out what the outcome is specifically. If, you, um, uh, if you'd like to also know about cases beyond this year, or rather uh, before 2012, um, the same search facility allows you to look at all of this data over time. So you can select your time period, you can do it from the beginning of UDRP, or you can take an interval, or you can compare it between the last two years, however you like. Um, in terms of the geographical distribution, um, here we, uh, again, we, uh, this is based on a search facility which we make available, um, where you can also make your selections on the side of the complainants, on the side of the respondents, uh, or on the side of particular countries as well. Um, if you do it on the side of particular countries, you will find the evolution over time. So, uh, and to the extent that the stats still don't answer all the questions, our facility, which is real-time connected to our database of cases, then please, you know, just give us a ring today, anytime, an email, and we can get you the information more specifically. Um, with some distance, I can say that uh, traditionally the United States has been and continues to be the largest um, uh, uh, let's say, location of trademark owners filing cases and also the largest location of respondent parties, owners of domain names, let us say, uh, who are being uh, implicated uh, in these cases. Um, however, there is an evolution there and the evolution, I think, uh, the evolution uh, really, again, connects to the use of the internet. The use of the internet uh, is, let's say, relatively speaking, probably moving east uh, from here. Asia, China, Southeast Asia, the emerging economies, they're all becoming bigger players uh, on the internet, including in domain and registrations, both internationally and in their national domains. And I think that over time, one can also see that back in the statistics, but not only on the respondent side, but also on the complainant side, where trademark owners from those jurisdictions are also becoming more involved. Hmm. On, on Annex 6, you know, a very crude, if I may say, you know, way of looking at it is on the left hand side is the goodies, on the right hand side the baddies. You know. this, the, the ranking for the top 25 is in Annex Sorry. 6. Um, if you'd like to have it in full, so if you are, for example, wondering about the particular jurisdiction on the complainant or the respondent side beyond the top 25 that we have listed for 2012, you'll find that precisely in, those, in the statistics page, so you can go down to the last country, so to speak, involved with the most minimal amount of cases. Uh, and you can also find this geographical distribution, distribution over time in that way. We've just singled out the top 25 because, uh, because we think that those are probably telling the story uh, of registrations and infringement in a more significant way than if we would go down to 120 names. Can you just say how long China has been at the sort of 500 level? Is that new or is that... Uh um, China has been has been moving up 
if you if you if you go uh, if you go uh, back to, for example, our press releases, but also our database today, uh, over the, let's say the last five years, then you will see that China has been entering steadily into the top ten, and then a little bit up within the top ten, as you can see. Um, I think again, what what if you set that off, for example, against uh, registrations in the national domain of China .cn, you'll find that that has become one of the largest, I do not know the exact statistic today, but that has also likewise, in a sense, broken into the top ranks, surely in the top 10 of all domains, including the international domains. So, so that's, I think, telling us that, um, that squatting in such a location is not necessarily a, 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 just a question of you know, uh, people changing their mind and starting to, to enter into this behavior, but it's also a function of electronic commerce becoming more and more uh, prevalent in such jurisdictions or in such locations, I should say. But also, it's obviously, in the US, a lot of these cases can be from the US to the US, right? Because the US is uh, top of the table in both, but China is uh, nowhere. It's, uh, on the clay? 23rd on the, on the complainant. So as a goodie, it only ranks, it's got nine cases, and as a baddie, it's got 500. So yes. it's obviously international for China. But yes. It's it's probably too, let's say, a little bit too, 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 too easy to presume that if, you know, if the U.S. is more or less 50 percent on both, uh, both counts of this equation, then that, you know, that is quite against one another. But you're absolutely right that the chances of, 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 of it being U.S., U.S., for example, uh, or the case staying, let's say, in, in Western uh, uh, locations is larger than in the case of China. However, uh, if we can maybe you know, zoom out from these dispute statistics, and WIPA is also, Director General has, 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 of course, also, as you know, been putting out information uh, about, for example, the Madrid statistics, the Madrid system for trademarks. And if you combine all of these things, then I think it's, it's quite likely that you're going to be seeing Chinese trademarks coming up on the complainant side in these disputes as well. It just, there is just a certain lag time, but if the registration numbers that we see at WIPA are any indication, then the East, if I may put it like this, the Far East, Southeast Asia are very likely to be the ones moving up uh, also on the left side of the table over time. Mm -hmm. I should have said alleged goody and alleged bad. Well, that was our headline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.